very warm welcome to Dundonald Church at 6.30 online, and especially if this is your first time joining us. Uh, I understand that uh, a quarter of the country has been looking online at church during this pandemic season, so if you're uh, new to us, you're especially welcome. We're thinking a lot at the moment about uh, our mortality and death and things that are happening around us in this troubled time, obviously with the uh, deaths in this country rising all the time and now alarmingly in Russia and other parts of Asia, we really are being forced to think about our mortality. And we're going to hear from God's word this evening about how to think about that D word that no one wants to talk about, uh, death that will come to us all. How wonderful that God is willing to talk to us about the things that we struggle with and find difficult to talk about. People often ask if God is good and God is powerful, then why doesn't he end all the suffering in the world? And since there's obviously lots of suffering going on, that maybe he doesn't exist. Of course, the other option is that God is good, God is loving, but that there's a good reason for allowing the world to carry on. And the Bible tells us that the biggest reason is to give more and more people the opportunity to turn to Jesus and find access to God and to the world that he will one day bring in. And so he prolongs this world, including the suffering, to give more and more people this opportunity. But he's doing more than that. He's allowing us the opportunity to join him. And uh, not only has he sent his son to die for us on the cross, not only will he bring a new world one day, not only is he spreading the word through the, through the nations of the world as more and more people turn to Jesus, but as we hear from this opening verse, as we think this evening, suffering is also something that helps us to be more helpful to other people. Listen to these words from the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 1. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. How true that is that when we've struggled and faced suffering and difficulty, we are often learned to be more helpful to others when they face struggles too. So let's pray as we begin. Uh, let's pray that God will teach all of us, but in particular so that we can be a comfort to others. Let's bow our heads and pray as we begin. Almighty God, we thank you that you have sent your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die on a cross to give us access to the new world. I thank you that one day he will return and that we will be resurrected and that all who turn to Jesus will be welcomed into a new world without any disease or suffering. And thank you that while we wait, you are spreading the word through the world and more and more people from every kind of background are discovering new life in Jesus. But thank you also that the things we learn in times of hardship and suffering and difficulty, the comfort that we receive from you helps us to be comforting to others. Where we have received and experienced your compassion, you help us to become more compassionate towards others. And we do want that. We want to be more compassionate and comforting people. So please, we pray this evening, whether we're new to these things and find all very confusing, or whether we're familiar and committed followers of Jesus, help us to learn things about you that will be a comfort, not only to us, but to other people. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to uh, say together, remotely, uh, the Apostles' Creed, uh, which is a, an historic document that summarizes what Christians have believed around the world for many, many centuries. And so I'm going to say it aloud slowly. You might like to say it aloud where you are if you believe these things. Um, or if you're not a believer, um, then why not listen in and listen to the things that Christians think are important to declare and to remember. Or we could just say it quietly in our hearts if we want to. But I'm going to say it out loud now, phrase by phrase. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. 
He was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. From there he shall come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I'm going to hand over now to uh, James, who's going to lead us in a wonderful song about the grace of God. Came 
down to find us let us out of death to you alone belongs the highest praise hi if we haven't met before my name's genevieve johnston i'm on the dundonald staff team with the particular responsibility of helping to coordinate the ministry that is run either by or for women. I'm very aware of the polarising effect that lockdown is having on uh, women in our country and therefore in our church. I think there are two experiences that um, you can fall into, either uh, of never having been as busy as this in your life before and therefore extremely drained and uh, tired by the whole thing, or perhaps never having had so little to occupy yourself with before and looking for things to do. Uh, whichever of those two situations you find yourself in, I'm hoping that we found some helpful resources uh, which we've signposted on the Women's Ministry page of the Dundonald Church website, uh, which will help you either just keep going or growing in your love and knowledge of the Lord at this time. So for those who are uh, busier than they've ever been before, we've signposted some really short podcasts with the aim of helping just to refresh you in God's word, provide a bit of Bible reflection in really manageable uh, sizes. And because they're audio, you can listen to them on the go, ideally with your feet up. But if that's not possible, then you can multitask and get a bit of refreshment from God's word at the end of a busy day. If, however, you are looking around for things to do because you've never had so little to do in your life, perhaps you're on furlough, perhaps your family lives a long way away from you and your social life has massively reduced, then we've signposted for you uh, some useful resources to help keep you growing uh, at this time. Some resources for training, uh, longer podcasts, some training resources, and in particular, we're launching a women's ministry training program uh, next week. So if that's something that you'd be interested in, head over, as I say, to the Women's Ministry page of the Dundonald Church uh, website and have a look at those and sign up if you're keen to participate in that. Either way, our prayer for you at this time is whatever your experience, that these resources would help keep you going or growing in your love of the Lord at this time. Let us pray. Dear loving Father, thank you that we can come to you now with our prayers. We praise you that whether we're busier than ever before or have time in our hands to fill, your word helps to keep us going and growing in you. We pray that the resources on the Women's Ministry page of the church website would be an encouragement and refreshment to many. Thank you for our mission partner, Danielle Taewan Green, who is a UCCF staff worker. We praise you, God, that many students are more open than ever to tuning into online church, attending virtual events and having conversations with Christian friends. We pray that Christian Union students will take up opportunities to share the gospel with friends as they hold online evangelism events and do one-to-one -one seeker Bible studies. We pray especially for students who have returned home to unbelieving families in the UK or overseas and that they might be salt and light to them. We pray for Danielle as she rests and reads while being on furlough and pray that she would be better equipped and ready to serve her London CUs when she is allowed to return to work. And we pray that universities would make wise decisions about reopening in September and that CUs are able to faithfully and creatively share the gospel with new and returning students. We pray for the persecuted church, and in particular for Christians in Turkey. We pray for dozens of expat Christian volunteer workers, most of whom have lived in Turkey with their families for decades. During the past year, at various points, they have not had their residency permits renewed or have been refused re-entry after trips abroad. 
This is a calculated effort to weaken the Christian community in Turkey and is one of many methods of persecution through which they are pressured and intimidated. Lord, we pray that you would be a source of comfort and strength to those families who have been separated as a result of these entry bans. Lord, we pray that you would overturn these bans so that Christian workers may go back to Turkey to continue your works. And Lord, we pray that you would strengthen, grow, protect and embolden the indigenous Turkish church and that the Turkish government would relent in its oppression of Christians. And Father, in a time of much uncertainty, suffering and death with COVID-19, we praise and thank you that we can come to you with all our anxieties. Thank you for sending your one and only son, Jesus, to die on the cross for us, that we can be saved from the punishment of our sins. Thank you that we can trust in your promises of eternal life spent with you, where there will be no sorrow, pain or death. Please help us to constantly be reminding ourselves and each other of these truths. And may your word dwell richly in our hearts and minds richly so that we might also be equipped to share your good news with others who don't yet know you. As you say in Philippians 4, 6 to 7, please help us to not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, may we present our requests to you, our loving Father. And may your peace, which transcends all understanding, guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. This evening's reading is from Psalm 90, verses 1 to 12, and we'll be reading from the New International Version. I'll give you a moment to find that. Psalm 90, verses 1 to 12. Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the whole world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn people back to dust, saying, Return to dust, you mortals. A thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by, or like a watch in the night. Yet you sweep people away in the sleep of death. They are like the new grass of the morning. In the morning it springs up new, but by evening it is dry and withered. We are consumed by your anger and terrified by your indignation. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. All our days pass away under your wrath. We finish our years with a moan. Our days may come to 70 years or 80 if our strength endures, yet the best of them are but trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass and we fly away. If only we knew the power of your anger. Your wrath is as great as the fear that is your due. Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Good evening. I hope you're keeping well at this time. Wherever you are, it's a great privilege to look together at God's word. We're looking at the uncomfortable but unavoidable topic of death. With all that's going on in the world, you will guess why it's important for us to talk about this now. And a few weeks ago in our daytime services, we thought about death part one. What will happen when we die? And we saw that the Christian faith offers great hope in the face of death. So if you're wondering about what happens to our bodies and our souls, when and how will we be raised? Well, then you might like to find that talk on our website or our YouTube channel. But this evening, we're thinking about the other side of the coin, not what can we expect after we die, but how should we live before we die? How should death affect the way that we live is the question we're thinking about. Now, many people have pointed out that we don't like to talk about death in our society. We'll talk about almost anything else, but it's awkward to talk, to think about this. I heard a story of a man who went to hospital to visit his father who was sick, terminal, in fact, and they knew there was no more treatment available. And as they were chatting, this man just sort of blurted out, Dad, how does it feel to be dying? And he says as soon as he said that, he felt 
embarrassed, guilty, and apologize straight away for being insensitive. It seems we find it almost impossible to talk about death, even when it's happening, even with those who are closest to us. Which of course is one of the many reasons we might be finding it very hard emotionally during a pandemic where death rates and statistics and all that is everywhere around us. Turns out, actually, this week is Dying Awareness Week in the UK. I hadn't realised that. Hospice UK runs this campaign once a year, and this is our Dying Awareness Week. But if we need a Dying Awareness Week, that just shows how hard we find it to talk about death and dying in normal life. You might wonder, why is that? Why do we find it so hard to talk about these things? There's loads of reasons. I think a big one is because death blows up so many of the illusions, the stories and slogans that we tell ourselves. You might say it's a big threat to the Disney Princess Guide to Life. What do I mean? Well, hear the slogan, you can be whatever you want to be. Be the hero of your story. Now, I'm not trying to be harsh to Disney princesses. That just picks up the mood of our moment. You see this all across the board. So take the runner, Eliud Kipchoge, last year, amazingly ran a marathon in under two hours, the first man in history to break the two-hour mark. It was a huge event. And you know the strap line for this big challenge, what it was supposed to prove? No human is limited. And it captured the imagination of a TV crew and audiences at home and big crowds and sponsorship money no human is limited. Of course, it turns out it's the almost exact opposite of what the event proves. I mean, you take one, the, the greatest marathon runner of the modern era, and then you add 41 other world-class athletes to be his special team of pacemakers. Then you pick a favorable running track that's um, flat as anything, and you pick the right weather conditions and and refuel and liquids and all the stuff that they could possibly need, and you get all of that right, then one man can break this one limit, and even then only by 20 seconds. It still took him one hour, 59 minutes, and 40 seconds to run the marathon. Now, here's the thing. Assuming Elliot isn't tuning in to see this stream, I can pretty much guarantee all the rest of us are limited. And no human is limited. We're all limited in loads of ways, not least that we can't run a marathon in under two hours. No human is... Of course, all humans are precious and valuable with great dignity, able to do great things. But to say no human is limited, that's absurd. And death is what proves it's absurd in the end. You see, death is the great limit on all our ambitions and achievements. And so we try to block out death from our thinking and our talking, even though it's the one thing that unites all people at all time in, in all places of the world. Doesn't matter if you're rich or poor. Doesn't matter if you're a key worker or working from home or out of work or on furlough. Doesn't matter who you are, young or old, death unites us all. And the good news is God's word doesn't try to block out things that are inconvenient or uncomfortable for us to hear. Sometimes I hear people say, well, why bother with the Bible? Isn't that just a load of fairy tales to made up to help people escape from reality? I think, well, really? Have you read the Bible? I mean, it's full of all the questions and longings and tensions and trials and puzzles and pain and mess of life. It's as real as real can get when you read the Bible. No, it's us. We're the ones who are full of fairy tales that we tell to escape from reality. So how does death affect the way that we should live? That's our question. Now we will skip around a few passages this evening to catch some of the key notes of the, the biblical tune. But base camp will be Psalm 90. So if you could turn, please, with me, if you haven't got Psalm 90 in front of me, look, look with me at verse 12, which was the last verse that Paige read for us. And this is a key verse 
and the Bible's teaching of death and also on life. This Psalm, Psalm 90, if you, you look at the top, it tells us a Psalm of Moses, the great man of God, which is probably the oldest Psalm we have. Moses, the leader of God's people during the Exodus in Egypt. He's right up there, pretty much after Jesus as the, one of the very greatest characters in the biblical story. He's seen a lot of stuff. He's done a lot of stuff. So what does he say? What does he want people to hear as he's inspired by God's spirit? Psalm 90 verse 12. Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. In other words, he's saying, if you want to be wise, remember you're going to die. If you want to be wise, remember you're going to die. And he's saying, God, he's speaking to God. Would you teach us that? Would you get that into our heads and into our hearts? Teach us that we are given a certain number of days between the day that we're born and the day that we die. We don't know what that number is. It could be one. It could be 36,000. But it is a number and you can count on it. Incidentally, my dear grandfather, who's 93, is pretty much the one person I know who takes this literally. So growing up, it used to blow my mind that you you, you could ask him and he would tell you not just how old he was in years, he could tell you in days. Helps that he's a ninja at mental maths. But this isn't just about mental maths. Teach us to number our days. Teach us to live as those who know we are going to die. Why? To gain a heart of wisdom. See, awareness of death is a key to unlocking wisdom in life. See, the Christian faith doesn't just offer hope after death, though it does. It also offers wisdom before death. And you flip that around the other way. If we spend all our time trying to block out death, well, then we're a fool to do so. So what does it look like to number our days and so to gain a heart of wisdom? We'll just see two things in light of Psalm 90, but also in light of the wider biblical teaching. First, don't pretend you're immortal. Don't pretend you're immortal. Teach us to number our days means don't think that our days are unlimited. I read that the mobile network EE is providing unlimited data to NHS workers at the moment. Or Pizza Hut back in the day, you could get unlimited ice cream. Zoom, you can get unlimited length calls if you get a paid for account. One thing you can't get unlimited, no matter who you are, is days to live in this present age, whoever you are. And if we want to be wise, we can't just bury our heads in the sand or in our work, or in Instagram, or in our DIY projects. That one writer said that so many of the the great things that we busy ourselves with are just immortality projects, our way of wanting to leave a mark on the world that will last, you know, like children scratching into the desk, I was here. The Old Testament book, Ecclesiastes, in many ways is an extended meditation on death and the troubling, puzzling implications that brings to life. See, life is short, just a breath, just a breath. We keep hearing in that book, a whisper in the wind. Life is elusive. It's like a puff of smoke. You you can't grab hold of it and put it in your pocket. It's gone. It's beyond you. And life is repetitive. On a big scale, we see generations come, Generations go, generations come, generations go. And on an individual level, for me, I get up, do some stuff, go to bed. Get up, do some stuff, go to bed. It might be in the past few weeks, it's felt especially repetitive and mundane for many of us. And yet, throughout Ecclesiastes, it seems the key, if you want to learn how to live, is you must prepare how to die. So Ecclesiastes 5 and verse 15. Everyone comes naked from their mother's womb 
And as everyone comes, so they depart. They can take nothing from their toil that they can carry in their hands. It doesn't matter if you're Bill Gates or Victoria Beckham or a homeless guy on the street. No matter how much you've got in the bank, you can't take any of it with you in the end. Now that can be quite an unsettling thought. And here's something that might sound even stranger to our ears. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and verse 1. A good name is better than fine perfume and the day of death better than the day of birth. It is better to go to a house of mourning than to a house of feasting. And you're better off going to a funeral than a wedding. Wow. Why? Here's the answer. For death is the destiny of everyone. And the living should take this to heart. Death is the destiny of everyone. The living should take this to heart. Now, you might be wondering, doesn't this all just sound a bit morbid, despairing? Now, if you don't have what the rest of the Bible teaches, then yes, it would be. And we will get there in a few minutes. But part of the reason that it grates on us so much is that we like to think that we're in control, that we can make a name for ourselves. We can be great. We can beat the cycle somehow. Sure, everyone dies, but I think that means everyone else. How often it is when personal tragedy or, or sickness strikes, we think, yeah, I knew all the statistics. I just never thought it would be me. And so death and pandemics shatter our illusions. Don't pretend you're immortal. Of course, this affects every detail of the way that we live and talk, and even the way that we make our plans. So we skip ahead to the New Testament, James chapter 4, verse 13. Now listen, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to this city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. I might say go on holiday, pass those exams, get a promotion, finish that project. James continues, why you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Just a breath, just a breath. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. Don't pretend you're immortal. That will actually seep through into every area and detail and corner of our lives. Imagine one of the hardest things for many of us over the past few weeks is to see our plans of various kinds devastated. And it could be small stuff. It could be really quite big life stuff. And it has meant that for me now, when I try to make plans, I mentally do have a little asterisk in my mind. You know, if that is reopened, if it's available for click and collect, if we're allowed to visit them, then we'll. But actually, the reality is there's always an asterisk on all my plans. Lockdown is actually no different in that regard. I just happen to feel it more than normal. You see, James tells us the asterisk should be, well, if it is the Lord's will, we'll do this or that. Lord willing, as it happens, we'll begin a series through the book of James soon. And you, you might know some Christians write Lord willing or, or DV when writing about plans and dates. DV is just a, a Latin abbreviation for God willing. And the, po the point of that, it shouldn't be to be pretentious or, or show off here in a pious kind of way. It's just that the wise tongue speaks with humility before God and before people. And the opposite is what James calls boasting. Overconfident, man-centered, self-assured. Well, that's arrogant. And the heavy reality of death can smash through some of our pride. It can shatter our illusions if you found that recently. Death can be a great teacher in the school of wisdom. So don't pretend you're immortal. I don't know exactly what that might look like for you at the moment, what it might look like practically. Maybe it's just when you wake up in the morning before your feet touch the floor, 
So we say to God, Lord, thank you for this day, which you have given me. I, I receive it as a gift from you. And I don't know how many more I'll have, but help me to enjoy this day as a gift and help me to use it well. It might just be as simple as getting into the habit of saying, Lord willing, when we make our plans. It might be actually putting an asterisk in your calendar or in your phone to remind us that all our plans are provisional, Lord willing. The, the five minute journal is a little notebook I picked up a while ago, which um, is to help people be reflective at the start and end of each day. So it's got a couple of spaces for bullet points, things I'm grateful for, and what would make today great. And then it has this section, daily affirmations, I am. And the, the example on, on the first one said, I am confident and comfortable in my own skin and I live with passion and purpose. And I'd like to meet that person, it sounds great. Wisdom says, we should also remember, I am, daily affirmation, I am going to die one day. Now, the many things we might learn from this pandemic, however long it lasts, let's not miss the chance to grow in the school of wisdom. Teach us to number our days. Don't pretend you're immortal. Now, that's the negative side. That's sort of the demolition job and the rubble clearing part of the job. Well, here now, here's the right foundation. Here's the house you actually do want to live in. Take shelter in the Lord who's immortal. Not immortal, eternal. Take shelter in the Lord who's eternal. See, it's so easy to hear what we've heard so far and actually just despair because our ears are so tuned into that Disney song. You can be whoever you want to be. There's no human is limited, but actually there is a much better song. And that's the song that Moses in this Psalm helps God's people to sing. That's short, so the song makes us humble. But the far side of humility, once you get through that gate, you realize it's, it's a place of cheerfulness, even confidence, a confidence you didn't know before. Maybe if you're not a Christian, you've noticed that about some Christians you know in the midst of all of this. It's just not confidence in myself or my plans, but confidence in the Lord. Look with me again at Psalm 90, how it begins. This is the foundation. That means when we get to teach us to number our days, this is actually good news and not despair. Verse 1, Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations, before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the whole world from everlasting to everlasting. You are God. See, generations come and go. People live and die. Our days are numbered. So you can speak of before you or I were born, before it, we hear the language about the mountains were born before the world was brought forth. But you can't speak of before the Lord. Generate from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. And not just God as a distant, impersonal one, but do you see you, verse one, have been our dwelling place. Moses, the great leader of the people of God in his time, their dwelling place was in Egypt as slaves. Their dwelling place then was in the wilderness in tents. Maybe that's where this psalm was written. But way more importantly than that, their true dwelling place, the place of safety, security, the, the true place we call home. Well, that was not in Egypt, nor in tents, but in the Lord. It's always been that way for the people of God. Did you notice this psalm is directed to God? You have been our dwelling place. You brought forth the world. You are, you are. And we see as we look at the verses one, verses one to two shows us, Lord, you are eternal. Verses three to six, Lord, you have made people mortal. Seven to 11, we see it's because of your anger. I wonder when we had those verses read, did you find them challenging, surprising? 
We are consumed by your anger, Moses says to God. We are terrified by your indignation. Again, those verses might sound very strange to our ears, but Moses, the great man of God, is clear. The ultimate reason death exists is not an accident. It's not random. It's not pointless. The ultimate reason why people made in the image of God, as the Bible tells us, made to dwell in the light of God's presence forever, the reason death exists, where we return to dust, is because God is angry at sin. Now that's about as far as you can get from the Disney princess world view. But underneath the frustration and the groaning and the, the trouble and the sorrow, underneath all of that is the, the judgment of God. And actually any experience of trouble or pain or plague can remind us in, in general terms that this is the case. God is angry at human sin and rebellion. And that's not pleasant for us to hear. Of course it's not. But remember Moses here, as we read this time, he's not just talking to about God, not just telling us stuff. He's actually speaking to God. He's speaking, you know, with confidence and even personal intimacy. Lord, you have been our dwelling place. And all these affirmations, Lord, you are, you've done. Well, it fuels a series of wonderful requests. We didn't get time to read them, but actually the, the rest of Psalm 90 has these Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love, that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. Make us glad, verse 17, may the favour of the Lord our God rest on us. See, awareness of wrath is not a recipe for dour and dead religion. So we see all the ways in which this psalm develops. Verse 11, if only we knew the power of your anger, your wrath is as great as the fear that is your due. If only we realized who we're dealing with. Your righteous anger, God, is the perfect and equal expression of the same holy character. That means that we should fear you, fear of the Lord, the very heart of wisdom. That we should love and worship and be loyal and reverent to you. See, wrath and reverence are perfectly proportionate. And then comes the verse we focused on, verse 12. So teach us, in light of all of that, in light of what you're like, God, and what we're like, and why it is that we are this way, teach us to number our days, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. That means don't pretend that you're immortal, Rather, take shelter in the Lord who's eternal. And so what does that look like for us to do that, to be those kinds of people? It turns out that we, like Moses, can sing to the Lord as our dwelling place and our refuge and the one who satisfies us in the morning with his unfailing love. We sing that only through the Lord Jesus Christ. We sing it as Christians. See, Jesus is the eternal God from everlasting to everlasting of verses 1 and 2, who became mortal man, 3 to 6, and experienced the full anger, indignation, wrath of God that's described in verses 7 to 11. As he died on the cross and he was laid down in the dust of the ground, and yet he saw the light of life beyond the grave, he was raised. He was satisfied in the morning because of the Lord's unfailing covenant love. He was anointed with the oil of gladness, received the eternal verdict of verse 17, the Lord's favor, and the guarantee that the work of his hands will be established without a shadow of a doubt. So we sing this song. We pray this song in Christ the greater Moses, the true man of God, in fact, the true God-man. And when we pray, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. We're really praying, teach us to be like Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. 
If you want to be wise, remember you're going to die. But that's not the way of despair. It's actually the way of Jesus. No one had a greater awareness of death than him. The Son of Man must be handed over and crucified. But no one had a greater wisdom in life and a humble, cheerful confidence in God as his dwelling place throughout all generations. And that's the kind of thing that shines brightly, even when all else is dark and despairing and locked down and fearful. So the Christian can write in their five minute journal each day, daily affirmation, I am going to die, but also I am in Christ who lives forever. He is my dwelling place throughout all generations. Which means we can really become wise, simultaneously humble and hopeful, no matter what is going on. Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Savior say, your strength indeed is small, child of weakness, watch and pray, find in me your all in Jesus paid it all. Dead and 
raise this life up from the dead. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Well, how wonderful it is to know that Jesus has indeed paid it all for us on the cross to give us access to knowing God and to an eternity with him. We've learned some wonderful things from God's word uh, this evening. It's great, isn't it, to be able to actually think and to talk about death. That it's wise indeed to think about our eternity. How foolish to be short-sighted. And how wonderful to know, to know that through Jesus, we can face death with confidence. We don't need to despair or be frightened, but that we can be humble and realistic and cheerful when we take refuge in God through Jesus. So let's uh, turn to prayer and uh, reflect on the things that we've been learning. Let's pray. Almighty God, we, we thank you that you do talk about the things that we find it hard to talk about and often don't want to think about and in particular that we shall all die and eternity is a very long time. Thank you for what we've learned that it's wise to think about eternity but we don't need to despair but through Jesus we can be free to be humble about ourselves, realistic about the future and cheerful in the face of death when we take refuge in God. And so we do pray, Lord God, that whether for the first time or for the umpteenth time, that we would take refuge in you, put our faith in you, trust in you, turn from living from ourselves to, to start living for you. And we pray, Lord, that as we learn about you, that as you have comforted us and shown compassion towards us, Help us to be a comfort to others. Please give us opportunities to share what we're discovering about you with others, that they too might know your compassionate love and your comfort in the face of death. Uh, so Lord, please be with us in the coming week. Uh, thank you for all that we've learned. Thank you especially for Jesus. We turn to him and put our confidence in him for the future. And we pray in his name. Amen. Well, I hope very much you've enjoyed uh, being with us. Do stay in touch. Don't forget that uh, uh, every Wednesday afternoon there's news online uh, updates uh, with some encouragements for you to read and think about and uh, news connected with the church. Uh, if you'd like to be involved in church and uh, you either want to ask questions or just get in touch and to, just to start to be involved in the life of our church, why not uh, send an email to the uh, our website and uh, we'll get back to you. We'd love to be in touch uh, with you and help you uh, just discover uh, more about God at your own pace, in your own time. Uh, but we've got a bit more of that at the moment, so it'd be a good time to get in touch. Uh, God bless, and uh, see you next week. <laughs>